So today we have only four presentations. So we have mm -hmm. uh, 30 minutes for each presentation. So after 12 minutes, I will say the last one minute. So if you are in the middle, then you can wrap up your presentation. And there may be uh, one or two comments we can accept, but uh, not many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, anyway. Okay, so now I think we have many people. Okay, so um, today we have four presentations. The each presentation is within 30 minutes. So if you finish early, early that's fine. And the, if you are still in the middle after 12 minutes, I will say last one minute so you can wrap up the presentation. And the, I ask you to comment on each presentation, uh, 15 to 40 words, uh, specific comments. For example, the some you know um, correlation plots are useful or something like that. So uh, yeah, so not just the general comments like an excellent presentation. And the comments on each co comments on each, each presentation is graded as a quiz, so you will get one point each. And it's due um, two days after the presentation. So for today's presentation, that you have to comment on uh, it by the April twenty first, um, eleven fifty nine p.m. Yeah, and the, you are also asked to submit the presentation files and code. They're already the form is available. So the just the submit after the. Uh, just immediately after the presentation, they was in the same day. So today's presentation, the submit the your presentation file by today at 11.59 p.m. You don't have to change anything after your presentation. Um, yeah, that's it. And do you have any questions so far? Yeah, and it will be recorded and it will be uploaded to the our website for other students to watch. Okay, so we start with the Antarang's presentation, then I'm thinking to go to, uh, I'm thinking that the second one is Priyanka and the third Rajesh and the fourth um, Paula. So I'm thinking about it. And okay, so Rajesh, that you can, share the screen you mean me yeah uh sorry sorry the antaran okay. uh, i cool, was confused cool. yeah um, uh, you can hear me fine right sound check sounds good yes. yeah, yeah yeah okay cool uh oh. all right so sorry let me uh go. you shared screen okay. sharing now okay great okay okay so let's start can you guys see it just fine Okay, cool. All right, so oh, that wasn't supposed to happen yet. Okay, I'm gonna start. Hi guys, so um, I did my project on ice cream. Uh, when I was looking for data sets, a lot of stuff sounded a lot more serious. And then I found one on ice cream and I was like, yeah, I like ice cream, I'm gonna do it on that. Um, so I got my uh, data set from Kaggle um, and it came with three parts to it. Uh, one part had product information like name, description, ratings, and then ingredients. Uh, just a little note about the ingredients, they were all in one column. Um, it came with the reviews data set, which had 21,000 records that included reviews for each flavor, number of dislikes and likes that each review got, what they rated it, and all sorts of stuff. And then the third part, which I didn't include in here, which was a a zip file containing images of each flavor. Um, the this data came from the brand websites for each for each brand. So Ben and Jerry's, Hagen Dazs, Briars, and Talenti. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know, whatever. But yeah, it came directly from their websites. Um, and whoever made the data set on Kaggle combined them all nicely and stuff. So that was nice. Um, so the objective that I had initially was to try to determine the ratings of the flavors based on some of the information present in these data sets, namely ingredients. Um, after that, I was for comparison, I wanted to see if I could get a decent rating um, prediction based on meta information 
information such as like the number of reviews that they might have had, um, number of helpful reviews or non helpful re helpful review reviews. Um, I could talk about that a little bit more later. And then the third that I tried just for funsies to see how it would work was a combination of the two ingredients and meta information. Um, I did make some modif modifications to the data, nothing like changing anything that was present, but this actually ended up taking a lot of my time when I was working on this um, project because it was a lot. So when I first made the um, my submission for my plan, I did a cursory look at the data and I made a guess saying that, oh, there's maybe 80 distinct flavors and I can boil it down from there. When I finally got to it, it was closer to 400. So um, that, that took a while to do, to get separate all the ingredients from one column in a separate unique list and then put them all as indicator variables to indicate whether a given flavor has it or doesn't have it. So if it was sugar, for instance, it would say true or false if it was present in that certain flavor. Um, another field that I added was total number of ingredients. I added consistency and primary color. Consistency and primary color were not inherent parts of the data sets, but they were. I did visually pull that information from the images that were provided. Um, chunky meant, you know, if anything had chunks of something in it. Creamy meant that it didn't. And shelled meant, you know, if you ever get a stick of ice cream and it's got like a chocolate shell around it. That's what I put. Primary color, you know, sometimes you get ice cream that has multiple colors, like Neapolitan has pink, white, and brown. Uh, so I said multi for that. Sometimes I even said, I feel like some colors I picked, if you like blended the thing together, what color would result, that sort of stuff. Um, my models that I use, I was initially planning on using KNN. But then once I finally got around to looking at the data and realizing that I had like 400 indicators, I couldn't really use that because you end up getting the curse of dimensionality, yeah. Um, which basically means that if you have too many predictors, the nearest neighbors end up being pretty far. So you don't really get too good of a indication of what some how to classify something. So I went with principal component analysis, analysis slash regression, which, is good for when you have more predictors than, well, much more predictors than rows. So it's also non-parametric. And I saw this online when I looked at it. It's, it's good for when data is not based on numbers. And I'm like, OK, cool. I just got a bunch of indicator columns. I guess that's fine. Um, little fallback is that you don't really get too much interpretability on your results. Like I can't run this and be like, oh, no, what was what had a good what what specific ingredient had a significant impact on you know results or something so that kind of sucked but whatever um i did a 2080 training test split um also my method for um, validating was using cross validating error with uh, k equals to 10. so just a little bit about the ingredient distribution was so the number the ingredient that shows up the most often was sugar. Surprise, surprise, it's ice cream. I don't know what you expected otherwise, but yeah. Um, mean number of ingredients was 15, the median was three. Uh, that probably mean, which I guess if you look at the graph, it makes a little bit sense that, you know, most things had a distinct number of um, ingredients and there were only a few that were common amongst all of them. Um, there were a number of ingredients that were only used once. I didn't consider these in the data set because if those were randomly not included in my training set, I don't know how that would impact what my results were. Um, some of these, you know, I looked at it, some of these ingredients were like M&Ms or Reese's pieces. And I'm like, eh, I should probably keep those in because you know, that probably makes an ice cream better, but whatever, I don't know. Um, so this is the... Uh, summary for the ingredient model, where I just jammed in as many of the ingredients as I could get. I picked um, five components because it had the lowest uh, cross-validated error. Didn't really seem to get that low, but that was the close, lowest one. And this second part of the model shows how much variance is, is explained by that many components. Doesn't get that high, but I was I went for I had a preference for cross-validation error in this. Um, my results came out kind of meh, which honestly I kind of expected once I started working on this. Um, the mean, root mean squared error was about 
0.59. And this graph indicates to some degree where my predictions were. Green are the predicted ones and red are the actual values. Um, unfortunately, I don't get a nice little line because the flavors are not ordered in any way. There's no like, oh, one flavor is one and blah. So it's just on index. So you just kind of get this vague idea that it didn't do too bad, but who knows, you know, interpretability kind of not the best with this, but I did my best, I guess. Um, this is the meta model I use. It's not that many indicators, but I also did try using K and N for this. And I got actually it was way worse than what I got for um, PCI. I ended up getting like an MSE of like 1.5, which, you know, if a rating is 1.5 off, it's not very good, right? Um, for this one, I ended up using two principal components, which again, also went with the lowest cross-validated error of 0.54. Um, that actually explained a fair amount of the variance in the model. Um, but it came out to 0.87 MSE, not the best. And you can see that from the graph that it kind of just grouped them all close to 4.5 with a couple outliers here and there. Um, and then I tried it again with all of the predictors, including meta, meta um, ingredients and then the ingredients, uh, meta predictors and then the ingredients, um, two principal components for this one. And it did a little bit better than just the meta one, but it didn't do, it did much worse than just the ingredients at 0.77. Um, so my results that I'm basically gleaned from this was that you can't necessarily predict the ratings based on ingredients, how I did it so far, like just based on the PCR um, model. I thought about this a little bit and it occurred to me afterwards that this is something of a problem that you get maybe if you've, if you've ever gone on like I don't know, Amazon and bought like a pencil. Then it's like, hey, I recommend dirt. Do you want to buy dirt now? And it's like, okay, you get into a problem of recommendation. It's a little bit hard because people have different tastes depending on stuff. And you can't necessarily just say it's based on ingredients. I guess that's common sense. But I figured I'd see if there's anything, any way to predict it nonetheless. Um, uh, predictors weren't necessarily independent. For instance, some in, some ingredients are probably always used with other ones. I didn't really have it in me to figure out what those were since I had, you know, 400 predictors. Um, I also tried this out too, where if you just ended up taking the mean um, mean rating from the training set and just testing with that, you got kind of a similar MSE that I get did get for the um, for the ingredient model. So that's that. Given more time, there's a couple things I would, I would have liked to explore. For instance, uh, pulling data from the reviews, such as seeing what words were frequently associated with positive re reviews and what words were frequently associated with negative reviews and adding that to the model in some capacity. Um, and like maybe seeing if certain flavors get different reviews at different times of the year. Um, Another thing that I noticed was, for instance, Ben and Jerry's does special slash event flavors. One of the examples was um, this flavor called Justice Remixed. I don't remember exactly what was in it, but it was uh, a promotional ice cream that they put out that I guess was, uh, they were raising money for, I guess, police reform. It was around the whole George Floyd uh, time thing. I would like to see if that had any impact on ratings or not, if it made them improve or go down or if that had anything, any sort of impact on anything like that. Another thing I wouldn't mind trying that I think probably would have yielded some degree of results is grouping the ingredients in a certain way. For instance, seeing if like sugar-free, like, oh, these ingredients indicate sugar-free, summing them up and then using that total as an indicator or oh, this one's organic blah, 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 you know, finding certain groupings for ingredients and using that and seeing if that does anything. But yeah, um, or finding the ingredients that actually add flavor, because, you know, sometimes these ingredients don't necessarily have anything that adds flavor. Uh, like if you actually go and look at your ice cream tub and look at the ingredients, there's some weird stuff on there. But yeah, um, yeah, that's all I got. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's interesting presentation. I think the data handling is 
the, a little bit hard for this project because the uh, yeah text data is complicated. Um, so the, you mentioned the helpful and unhelpful reviews. So those are already ready-made variables, or you made it? Uh, helpful and unhelpful reviews. So they each review had like likes and dislikes associated with it. So uh -huh. it was a column in there. So what I did was I summed up all. For instance, there's one flavor like BJ01, right? That's uh -huh. the I key for it. I just went and summed up all the likes and all the uh -huh. dislikes. Okay, I see. The idea being, would people be more likely to upvote a review that had mm -hmm. that they I liked, see. I see. You know, or dislike? So yeah, I see. Uh, do you have any questions from other students? Anyone? can ask a question to Antarang. Uh, I thought it was interesting how you uh, included the colors of the ice cream. And uh, were those ever included when you when you broke down your models? Were those part of the components as well? I, you know, like I said, with PCR, it's, it, I don't really get to look and see what has significant impact on it. Um, so, meh. The only thing I can really say about it is the data set that included it, it didn't do too good yeah. in terms of MSE. So, and again, thinking logically about it, I'm like, I don't really necessarily care what color the ice cream is, right? It's mm -hmm. more how it tastes. I just thought I'd throw it in there and see how it did. So, yeah, it was interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. hey, thank you. Um, okay, so. Maybe next one. Um, uh, do you have any questions? No? OK. So next, Priyanka. So can you uh, share yes. the screen? Uh, yes, Professor. So, um, can you see my screen now? Yeah, Indian River patient. Yes. yes. OK. So. OK, so me... you can start. Yes, okay. So, hello everyone. I'm uh, Priyanka Ahire, and uh, today I will be presenting on uh, Indian liver uh, patient data set. So, this is basically um, a classification problem. So, the main objective of this uh, project is to study, uh, study is to compare forecasting performance of a different classification models such as logistic regression, LDA, QDA. And uh, I try to do it with uh, LDA with tenfold CV. And uh, I'm going to introduce one new link function, which is like code sheet uh, link function uh, that we will just talk about in later slides. So the next is get to know about the data. So the data is um, available through UCI machine learning uh, website. And it has basically 583 observation, which is, I think, not too big data, but uh, yeah, which is fine to handle. And it has total 11 variables, which has uh, different, different predictors like class, age, uh, gender, TB, and uh, other variables, which I will explain uh, in next slides. And uh, it has two classification, um, which is described as one for liver patient data and uh, two as a non-liver patient. And for the cleaning the data, it, it was pretty clean. Uh, I, I, I don't have to do much for cleaning data, but only thing I did is uh, uh, columns for variables was not uh, there in the data set. So I just, uh, added the columns for the variables name um, in CSV file. And then uh, few data was missing from this uh, AG ratio. So I used any omit function so that I can just uh, omit the missing values. And I observed the uh, histogram and bar plot for different, different uh, variables. And I, I visualized the data from the CSV file and I came to know that there are few outliners which, which might affect the result. So that's why there were, um, I remove approximately nine outliners from the data. 
so finally um, i just have 570 observation uh, in the data set uh, which has uh, 405 observations of liver patient data set and rest of the data are for non liver patient so here is the structure of um, uh, indian liver patient data set uh, now let's little bit talk about the uh, predictors i am not a uh, bio or med major so i just got little bit information from the uh, internet uh, so the first thing is uh, first we have age um, and the gender of the patient and then next is uh, total uh, bilbrin uh, which is a orange orange yellow pigment that occurs normally when um, part of your red blood cells break down so which is uh, actually a test which measure the amount of bilberin in your blood and it's used to help find the cause of your health conditions like jaundice um, anemia and liver disease and now next is the direct bilberin which is um, attached by the liver to gluconic acid and uh, glucose de uh, glucose derived acid is called as a direct or conjugated bilbrin and next is um, alkaline phosphate um, these are all the medical terms so um, the alkaline phosphates is enzyme in a person's blood that helps break down uh, proteins and using um, alp test it is possible to measure how much the enzyme is circulating in person's blood and the next is SGPT. I, ha I have denoted this as SGPT, which can also known as alminine amino transference. So I just gave a short form of um, SGPT, uh, which was in the data set. So um, alminine uh, amino process is an enzyme found primarily in liver and kidney. And uh, ALT is increased with liver damage and it used to screen uh, for uh, monitor liver disease. Um, and next is SGOT, which is, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly, which is um, aspartate um, aminotransference, which is also as an enzyme that is found mostly in the liver but also in the muscles. So when your liver is dam damaged, it releases AST into your blood stream and AST blood test measures the amount of AST in your blood. And the test can help your healthcare provider diagnosis liver damage or disease. And the next is a total protein, which can combine the next two predictors, which is um, Elburn, um, albin and the ratio albin and uh, uh, globin ratio so which is kind of protein in your bo body and the total body uh, test measures the total amount of uh, alb and uh, ag ratio so which basically contain the next two predictors so this is a uh, kind of all the uh, little bit background of all the predictors like how how they are going like how we are going to measure that in the data set so now let's talk about the um, uh, data so here i have uh, plot the bar plot for gender so as you can see that we have more um, data for the male compared to female and same as the classification problem uh, sorry class we can see that uh, one is for um, liver patient data set and two is for non-liver so we can see that we have more data for the liver patient liver patient compared to the non-liver patient and uh, here is the histogram for the age so as you can see this histogram it's it it is normally distributed according to the uh, data and the histogram and uh, here is the correlation chart for the data. So as we can see that from the chart, um, the DB and the TB, I just gave a short form. So that is mostly um, highly correlated as we can see that because it has the dark blue color. 
and we can see that the dark blue color has a uh, one so which we can see that it has a highly high, high correlation positive high correlation and then um, after that we have um, SGOT and SGPT it also have a positive correlation and then uh, we have ALB and TP and then after that we have AG ratio and ALB that also has a positive correlation um, now next uh, we can see the scatter plot here so here uh, one uh, sorry red color is for uh, I would say a non-liver data set and uh, the black color we can see that, that it's for a liver patient so I have just classified that in different colors so that we uh, we can easily identify it uh, okay so now um, I can introduce a logistic regression so I fit the model uh, of class with all the predictors so here I got AIC 586, which is pretty uh, good, I guess. Um, and uh, here what I get. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is just I fit a logistic regression. And then I was I wanted to try something like if I can get any significant predictors and if I can remove something. So I was inter interested to do um, backward deletion so i did that with the logistic regression of our first model so out of 10 predictors i got six predictors which are significant and useful for our model so for that um i got aics 581 which is pretty good compared to the first model so then i so that's why i decided to just go with this model so we have AIC of 581.66. And for the same model, I try to find out the error rate, uh, which we got 0 0.2649, uh, which is like we have 74% correctly classified by uh, logistic regression. And at the same time, uh, I would like to check the uh, area under the curve. Since uh, this problem is a binary classification problem, so I would like to introduce uh, AUC, which might be more useful and, with, and more accurate for the binary classification problem. So where we can see that we can um, find the ROC curve is an evolution metric for the binary classification problem. So which is the best for the binary classification problem? And we can say that the higher the AUC, the better the performance of the model um, we can get between the positive and negative classes. And um, if we have AUC between 0, 0 0.5 to 1, so we can say that the high chances that the classifier will be able to distinguish the positive class values from the negative class values. And here we got uh, AUC as 0 0.7762 which is I think approximately 0 0.77. So I think which is pretty good. Um, and yes, now I would like to introduce you a link function. Uh, so first of all, um, you might be wondering like, I, I have not used linear regression for this problem. So the thing is um, we will not get exact um, good result for applying the linear regression for the binary classification problem because if you will fit the regression that will give the predictor values for some individuals which are outside the zero to one range of probabilities. So that's why um, I have not used the linear regression for uh, this data set. So uh, next, uh, that's why I introduced the link functions, which might be very helpful for the binary data and the data which is not normal. So according to my uh, data set, few predictors are not normal, um, which are um, almost rightly skewed data. So at that One time- One more minute, sorry. Yes, sure. Um, you can you can continue, but the one more minute. Oh, okay, sorry. 
Yes, yeah, so I just introduced link function. I think I can uh, talk more about that uh, later. Or I can explain that later. So I just used the Cauchy function. And from that, I got AIC. Uh, this is my code, which I use for Cauchy. Uh, so I got AIC, which is, I think, pretty similar to the backward deletion. And uh, AUC 0 0.7693. Um, and then I used the... LDA function, uh, sorry, LDA, uh, where also I got 71%, which is, I think, okay. Um, and also, yeah, we have probability of liver patient is 71% and probability of non-liver patient data set is 29%. And this is the ROC curve for LDA and where we got AUC as 0.7425 which is less than AUC for logistic regression. Um, and then I also performed the LDA with uh, a log transformation. And I just try to do a different transformation uh, to just see where I can get a good result. So where I got 74%. And also we can say that AUC, see that AUC 0.7658. Um, and similarly for QDL, so I got some things. I think I can directly go to the final result mm -hmm. for the summary. So here is the summary I have. So for the logistic regression, we can see that uh, we have 0 0.272 and AUC is 0 0.7663. So we can see that we have, um, I think we got good result with the logistic regression so far comparing compared to other models. So I think I, I find out the result because of binary classification problem, uh, which is, I think logistic regression is best for that. So I think that's it. I can explain more if you have any questions since I skip a few slides. Um, thank you. So basically you did the, um, you evaluated the AUC and the AUC for the in sample, oh. I mean, training set. Is that right? Um, or you use cross validation or test uh, training test approach? How uh, you calculated the AUC? OK, so for AUC, I, I directly calculated from the predict uh, predicted value. So basically, in sample, the training set, yes. training mm -hmm. AUC. OK, great. Yes. Do you have any questions from other people? No, it's especially the for those who are doing binary classification for the final project. No. Yeah, I think I can explain more if you have any questions because I. I might have skipped more slides. So, yeah, just I, I want to mention about the Cauchy distribution. That is the similar to logistic regression, but uses different function. So Cauchy distribution is very heavy tailed function. So it's you know uh, better for data set with more outliers. Less outliers, probably the probit model, which uses the normal CDF, is performs best. Lo logistic is the in between. So we have several different link functions. And it's rarely compared, but uh, there are several uh, functions available. OK, so next, uh, maybe Rajesh. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Mm -hmm. no Hi, can you hear me? Yep. OK, let me share my screen. I think, uh, yep. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see. I can see the slides. OK. Yeah, OK, you, you can start. Hello, everyone. So today, uh, and I'm, I'm Rajesh, by the way. Uh, today, we're going to talk about obesity in the United States. Um, obesity has risen over the last two decades. Um, as of the 2017-2018 year, it was 42% uh, of the United States is obese. Um, 
And obesity can cause other health issues such as diabetes, strokes, heart disease, et cetera. Uh, so the data that I uh, that I use is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more famously known as the CDC. Uh, and the data comes from uh, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. And I use data from two testing periods, so 2015 and 2016, and then 2017. Uh, the data is split into many subgroups. So there's demographics, dietary data, examination data, laboratory data, and questionnaire data. Um, and then most of these subgroups have many data files within them, so they require separate downloading. So, but the saving grace is that they all had uh, ID numbers attached to them, so I was able to merge the files. Um, the original, like when you combine all these data files, there's, I want to guess, like 2,000, 3,000 variables. So it's a lot of work, but I was able to reduce the amount of variables analyzed to 25 variables. Um, and then I removed the rows, which had uh, NAs in them, uh, no data and stuff like that. And then I was able to end up with 800 data points. Uh, and I also want to talk about the response variable for all this, which is the body mass index. Uh, as you can see, that's the classification. Uh, so we have 18 and a half and under is underweight. 18, or sorry, 18, less than 18 and a half is underweight. 18 and a half to 24.9 is healthy. 25 to 29.9 is overweight. 30 plus is obese. Um, so what I did was I removed the underweight data because the main purpose of this analysis is to analyze obesity incidence. And there aren't, there weren't that many underweight uh, people in the data set. I think it was like 2%. Uh, and another thing I did was I created a separate variable called healthy. Uh, what I did was I grouped the healthy and overweight uh, people into, into one class, which I called zero. And then the obesity, um, obesity people had a label of one. So the variables that I used, uh, I used uh, some of the common ones, age, gender, ethnicity, uh, and, and other demographics. Uh, and then dietary uh, information I use is protein, carb, and fat consumption in a given day, uh, body fat percentage, uh, insulin, cholesterol, urine flow rate, uh, systolic and uh, diastolic blood pressures. And then questionnaire data I use are sleep hours, uh, for example, drug use, hours worked last week, and some other ones. So I'm going to go through the descriptive statistics, uh, and then I'm going to go through the, the models that I worked on, which were uh, multiple linear regression, and then the classification. So this is uh, the histogram of the BMI uh, uh, of the data of the data that I used. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, there's a lot of people that are in the overweight and obese category. There's people in the healthy uh, category as well. And then as you can see, there are some outliers. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the, uh, the plot of the um, variable that I used, uh, the healthy one that I created. So as you can see, we have about 300 people that are in the obese category and about 500 that are in the non-obese category. Uh, and we have a correlation plot as well. As you can see, we have some, some variables that are correlated, some are weekly correlated, weekly negatively correlated. Um, and then the first model was the multiple linear regression. Um, so the purpose of this was to find significant variables, uh, variables that were most likely to affect uh, the body mass index. Uh, and I also wanted to find the most efficient model. Uh, and the response variable is the BMI itself, not the, not the variable that I created, but the BMI that was actually provided in the data set. And then the predictor variables are the one are the variables that I had mentioned before. Um, so these variables, the demographic, dietary, examination, lab, and questionnaire data, which are variables. Um, yeah. And then I ran a uh, I ran the multiple linear regression. Um, so as you can see, the R square value is fair. It's about 0.63. Uh, the p value is significant, and then the AIC uh, is 3,189. Uh, but you also have to check the assumptions. So once I did that, I found that the residuals show a non-constant variance. Uh, as you can see off to the side, there's some, there's some points. It's like a, it's almost like a pattern. Uh, and then you also have to check independence. So I did that through the multicollinearity. 
So I checked something called the VIF, which is the variance inflation factor. Um, so the, the variance inflation factor values that are listed below. Um, we generally look for values that are you know, obviously high, like really high. Um, no such values exist here. So uh, there aren't really any, there's no multicollinearity going on here. Uh, we also want to check linearity. And we can see that the linearity assumption is broken because we have the residual versus fitted plot. And you can see that the red line is almost like a quadratic uh, near the zero line. And that's not good. Uh, but we can see that our data is approximately normal, but there's still some outliers that are present. So what do we do about that? So as I mentioned, there's presence of outliers. So what I did was I employed Cook's distance, which shows the influence of outliers. And I removed values that are greater than one and a half times the Cook's distance. Uh, and once I did that, uh, I have the improved model right here. Uh, it's much better than what I had before. The p-value is still significant, but the r square is about 0.75, which is improved. Uh, and these are some of the most uh, significant variables that I have here. Uh, you have age, which is a negative correlation, uh, which tells us that younger people, uh, like younger people tend to be more obese. Uh, for example, you have fat consumption, which is uh, this BR2TT fat here which tells us that it, it's positive, which tells us that the more fat you consume, the more likely you, you are to be obese. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but, and then another example is this SLD012, which represents sleep hours. So as you can see, that's negative. So that tells us that the less you sleep, the more likely you are to be obese. Um, and the AIC is 2,251, which is better than before, uh, about better, uh, it was about 3,000 before. But I want to see if I can try to improve that. Uh, but first, we have to check the assumptions. Um, the constant variance, you can see, is a little bit better. It's improved. You can still see there's a little bit of uh, some points like near the right that are that are higher. But overall, it's better than before. And we still don't have any uh, obviously high uh, BIF values. So our multicollinearity good. <clears throat> Our linearity uh, assumption is also better uh, because as you can see, the red line here is more or less horizontal uh, near the zero line. And the normality uh, assumption is good too. There aren't any outliers and the line is approximately normal. So with the assumption satisfied, I employed a backward deletion process to find the most efficient model. Uh, and I came up with an AIC of, of 920, which is an improvement from the 2000 that I had before. And the most significant variables were gender, age, ethnicity, poverty ratio, uh, fat consumption, body fat percentage, pressure, uh, drug use, uh, and then sur the surveyor, the surveyed person was told to reduce calories. Um, yeah. And then the next uh, next part of this uh, presentation is the classification. So I analyzed my data through uh, these five. These five methods, the logistic regression, the LDA, the QDA, the KNN, and the random forest. And I analyzed uh, the metrics for each of these models, and I came up with the best models. Um, and I employed a 70% training with a 30% testing. Uh, and I want to go through the classification metrics. Um, so you have AUC, which is the measurement to distinguish uh, between classes. You have the specificity, which is the proportion of true negative cases. You have the sensitivity, which is the proportion of true positive cases, and a guideline to analyze, like, how do you know your specificity and sensitivity are good? Um, the guideline is that if you add these up and it's greater than approximately 1.5, it's a decent to good model. Um, the error rate uh, is essentially misclassification, and the precision is the proportion of correct positive identification. Uh, all of these have values between 0 and 1, with 1 being perfect. The error rate, uh, zero is all correct, one is all wrong. Uh, and all of these are tenfold cross-validated. Uh, and once again, uh, positive, which equals one is obese and negative, which is zero is not obese. So these are the results that I had. Um, as you can see, they have uh, fairly, fairly strong AUCs. Uh, the specificity is good for most of it, except for the KNN, uh, the sensitivity, Sensitivity is a strong for all of them. The error rate is 
is okay, it's manageable, but as you can see, the KNN is one is a little bit higher, and the precision, uh, the QDA and KNN tend to be lower. So based on my analysis, uh, the logistic regression and LDA seem to provide the best results because they had high AUCs, uh, sensitivities, and specificity value. They had low error rates uh, and high precisions. And the random forest option is also a decent one because uh, the precision is good. The error rate is also uh, low. Sensitivity is pretty strong. Specificity is also good. The AUC is also good. But we have this model, but you know who can benefit from these models? So healthcare centers, for example, can potentially uh, they can potentially prevent future health risks. They can analyze, uh, you know, what causes these, uh, what causes obesity? What are the most significant variables? Um, they can convince patients to undergo lifestyle changes, like improve their diets, incorporate exercise, and things like that. And another risk, as I mentioned before. Uh, that obesity can cause other health conditions and bills can rack up really fast. So it can prevent that. Uh, and healthcare researcher, or sorry, health researchers in general can also do something like this where they can analyze risk factors. You know, what are the factors that go into which, which essentially cause obesity or most likely to cause obesity? Um, and there's also relationships between obesity and other health risks that they can analyze. So for example, does cancer, is there a relationship between cancer and obesity or something like that? So that's, uh, that's something interesting. Um, so there are some pros and cons of the approach that I took. So of the BMI itself. So the BMI is general. It's not really gender specific and, and it is used by health researchers and it does provide a decent overall view of the health, but it doesn't take into account specific body characteristics. So for example, muscle mass, body fat percentage, because it's possible that someone may work out and have a lot of muscles, but they could be classified as overweight. Um, uh, one and another, minute left. Okay. And another con is that uh, the BMI is only based on two variables, height and weight. And there are some border cases as well, which, because for example, as I mentioned before, 25 to 29.9 overweight, but just because you're just barely overweight doesn't mean you're unhealthy. So there are those border cases as well. Um, and then future improvements. So, you know, if, if I were to work on this, if I had more time, what can I do? So I could try to incorporate more variables. Uh, I could try to incorporate other models as well. Uh, I can see if there's a, there's a better option than the KNN model. Uh, you can also look into more accurate measures of health than the BMI. Uh, and the body fat percentage was an intriguing option as well. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, one question from me. So in, can I see the classification results slide? Uh, so this is by tenfold cross-validation, you said, I think, right? And how did you calculate the, the range that you said the plus minus 0 0.02 or something? What that oh, means? So these, are, so these are the standard deviations. So what I did was when I performed the tenfold cross-validation, what I essentially did was I essentially repeated, uh, repeated the process 10 times. And then uh, whatever, whatever these AUCs were, I had them stored in, in, a, in a vector. And then I found the standard deviation of that. So the, it's the, so you did the 10 times, 10 fold cross validation once, then you pick the 10 numbers and te take the standard deviation of that. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, does anyone have any questions to Rajesh? Just a brief question here. Um, you showed a correlation plot. I'm curious to know which predictors were highly co correlated. Oh, yeah. Let me get to that. So I feel like with this data set, it's probably interesting to see. Yeah. See? Yeah. So uh, obviously, these ones are not really that useful. Uh, some of these ones that are most correlated are, let's see, you have the middle one right here. Uh, can you see my mouse? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, so these ones, uh, you got protein, carb, and fat consumption. These are uh, more likely to be correlated. Um, they're all that kind of makes sense because it's, it's yeah. dependent on uh, what you eat. Yeah. Hmm, um Let's see, this one though, uh, this is DXD to PF, which is body fat percentage. 
Um, there's a correlation between that and age. Uh, so that was interesting as well. And that was uh, sort of an improvement uh, that I was thinking about. Like if I had more time, I might do something based off of body fat percentage instead. Um, but that was something that I saw was correlated. Um, and then there's also, as you can see, there's healthy and the BMI. Uh, that's uh, as expected because the healthy, uh, that's the one that I created the variable and that's directly based off of the BMI variable. So that's why there's a correlation there. Thank you. Uh, yep. Uh, I actually also had a question real quick, if you don't mind. I think I cannot really hear you well. Maybe I, mic problem. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, how about now? Yeah. So you said you when you pulled the data from the CDC, you had like like two thousand predictors or something like that, right? Or a large yeah. number. How'd you how'd yeah. you get it down like twenty five? Do you like hand pick it or Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had to pick the variables. There were some variables that may like there were some variables that may or may not be that useful, but I just wanted to pick some that were, you know, that I felt were important that at least looked interesting. Because there was a lot of examination of laboratory data, which I mean, I'm not, I'm not a like, I don't work in medicine, so I don't really know a lot of those. But some of these other ones, you know, the, uh, let me see if I had the list. Yeah, some of these other ones, they were, you know, things that are more common, things that I guess I can explain, things that I know as well. Um, that's sort of why I picked these variables. I could have picked more as well, but uh, yeah, that's that's sort of why I. Had these variables. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> That's a very good question. So, yeah. When I the, um, hosted a conference, the, the two famous professors came to the, the, my company and the, um, they make some prediction modeling. And the originally, we, the, we have provided 100 economic indicators and the, they narrow down 14 predictors. Then after that, they did discuss modeling. But the if one can reduce 100 to 14, the most work has been done already. <laughs> yeah, 2000 to 25. Yeah, that's probably the most important process. That's always the case for statistical analysis. Does anyone have more questions? OK, so thank you, Rajesh. Um, that's a good presentation, especially the cross validation has been done for many uh, methods. And also the data is original. Um, next, uh, Paula. I'm here. Oh, yeah. Um, can you share the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, you can start. Okay, so I decided to do my presentation um, on predictive model, predict, predictive modeling on workplace absenteeism. And this is specifically a case study in the field of AO psychology because it's particular to just one workplace. So um, absenteeism in the workplace is defined as the hours um, that employees are aware are, are away from their work environment, whether that be virtual or in person. Um, there are multiple variables that have been found to affect absenteeism in IO psychology, such as, for example, the most studied ones are age, health-related variables, um, such as BMI and work conflict issues, for example, transportation transportation difficulties. So um, industrial organizational psychologists use models, um, which these are psychological models, such as job characteristics model to redesign um, jobs and in order to promote um, employee well-being as well as organizational profit because they go hand in hand. But this is um, a step beyond what I did for this um, presentation. So ideally what I would have wanted to do was to, um, um, understand um, the which variables were going to affect absenteeism. Specifically in this case, I defined my outline variable Y as the amount of hours that each um, employee was absent. And um, then after using, um, after finding which one was the best predictive model, then you, we would implement that model and um, 
uh, determine and attack those specific variables in order to create a better um, job characteristics model for the employees. But anyways, for this project, the objective is to um, compare two models to increase predictive performance on employees' absenteeism, specifically the employees of this company. So data, I got the data from uh, UCI machine learning, um, I never know how to say the word, um, but the data actually was posted on there by the two researchers that um, did all of the data collections and they are two um, industrial organizational psychologists and um, HR um, managerial professor studying um, in, at the University of Sao Paul in Brazil. So the data originally had 740 observations and 19 predicting variables. I didn't use all of the 19 predicting variables because honestly I thought that some of them were um, not useful in predicting absenteeism hours. For example, some of the variables that I did not use were um, uh, the day of the week that the, per, the each um, employee was absent, the number of paths that the employee owned, or for example, the number of children the employee owned. I thought that data, um, those variables were not that interesting. So after uh, deciding that I only wanted to use six predicting variables, which we'll, we'll, we'll um, look more into in a few minutes, I also decided that I was going to um, get rid of all duplicates in my data. And um, not duplicates, I'm sorry, of all the outliers in my data. And I decided to do that because um, each um, one of the variables that I have that I've chosen to use is ID. And ID refers to um, each employee. So each employee has a specific ID, but there were uh, numerous numbers of observations for each employee. So for example, ID three appeared uh, almost 15 times in the data set. So my outcome variable is Y in this case, which is the hours um, that the employees were absent. Okay, so my outcome variable um, Y originally was um, very skewed to, uh, I always get this confused, skewed to the right. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Skewed to the right. And so um, in order to uh, define a better normal distribution, I um, uh, decided to use natural log plus one. So I used um, log of Y plus one and that uh, and also removed uh, in total 16 outliers. Um, yeah, so as you can see over here for Y, we have um, still a little bit of a skew, but it's a lot less than the original one. Then the first predictive uh, variable that I use is ID. So I decided to change ID into a factor variable. And I did that so that I could um, have, I could have um, 36 levels because I have a total of 36 employees, although um, each one of them was absent for um, different reasons. That's why there's multiple observations for each of them. And um, so each level is supposed to represent um, an employee and uh, to kind of predict their, um, um, their um, absenteeism. So as you can see, yes. What is why on the right hand of figure? Here, why? Um, why is the um, log of, uh, it's our why, it's the same why. Oh, okay, I see. Log oh. of why, yeah, that's why it's, the numbers are so small. Oh. And um, as you can see, for example, we have um, uh, employees such as employee number three who has um, a lot more numbers um, of um, abstinences, a lot more hours. The second variable that I decided to use is the reason for absence. So in the reason for absence, there were from um, zero to 27 reasons listed. Most of them, I would say 75% of them were related to health. So some of the reasons, for example, were to um, go to a medical appointment, to a doctor's appointment, or um, things, again, related to your health. Um, the reason, the Reason for absences with the highest frequencies were medical consultation and physiotherapy, which I thought was interesting. And um, the skewness is negative for this variable. Then the other variable that I decided to use is work-related transportation expenses or X5. Um, and over here, we can see that um, on average, each employee spends $225 
although it was created in Brazil, they um, changed the data to dollars, so 225. And then uh, the next uh, variable that I used was the distance from residence to work. Um, the mean for this one is 29.84 um, kilometers. And then the next variable that I used is um, age. I thought age would be really important, especially since most of the reasons were um, related to health. Um, but the mean age for employees at this company was 36.39, which I thought was not very old. And as you can see, it's positively skewed. So we don't really have that many people over 45. Okay, and then finally, the last one that I wanted to use was BMI, but again, um, mead and median tell us that on average, people are um, pretty um, healthy. Although we can see over here that we do have quite a few people that um, have a BMI score of 31. Okay, so the, the methodologies that I used were, first I used a multilinear regression model. I just wanted to use multilinear regression model because um, I thought that it would be kind of interesting to see how it did not fit. I knew that this model was not going to be the best model because my data points were not linear. And um, so then I also decided to use generalized additive model and um, this worked pretty well initially, but then something happened with my coding today and then all my graphs um, now look completely different, but we'll see them very soon. And um, then I originally also did um, forest, uh, random forest bootstrapping for regression. And that was actually the model that worked best, but I struggled with um, doing model comparison and um, doing, yeah, comparing the two models. So um, uh, I didn't really get many results. Um, I first thought that maybe I could compare the models by looking at the adjusted R squared, but um, that is not possible because you cannot do that with uh, GAM or generalized added models. You, it doesn't exist. And um, so then I just decided to um, evaluate the adjusted R squared, the AAC and BAC for um, the multiple linear regression model. And it's not a good fit. And then I also did get the gamma, the gamma fitting, but it does not look like the original one that I had. The original one that I had actually uh, was looked very good. Um, but anyways, the only um, variable in here, predictive variable that we can see fits really well with GAM fitting is X1, which is um, the reason why person was absent, which makes complete sense. So X1 is a factor variable with the 25 or 30 different reasons. Is that right? Um, you said yeah. X1 is the reason. Okay, I see. So factor variable, okay. Okay, so um, the limitations are that the adjusted R square isn't in um, GAM. I really did not, was not able to complete. I initially wanted to do a cross um, validation, a 10 um, fold, 10K fold cross validation, but I was not able to um, execute it, um, but that would have been the best one to do. And then also if you were to add more models, such as for example, random forest model, then it would have been a lot better to at um, finding the best predictive variables. I also think that um, the multilinear um, regression was overfitting the model, obviously, because the model was not linear at all from the beginning and didn't even check assumptions of, um, normality. Um, and uh, another thing too, um, is that I um, think that um, in the future, that in the future, other future researchers could also um, investigate other possible variables, maybe even more so related to the workplace, rather than um, related to outside variables. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's good that the, you the, um, checked the distribution of Y first. So theoretically speaking, the only the distribution of residuals matter, right? But the, in reality, if Y is very skewed, the, usually the regression isn't very really stable. So 
yeah, I think it's good to transform the response first to make it somewhat, you know, uh, normal. Not completely normal, but th that's al always true. Adjusted R squared maybe could be calculated for GAM. Um, maybe no theory behind it, so no one can calculate it. No one will calculate it, but still, yeah, I think it's useful to calculate adjust R square for GAM. Yeah, that, that may be uh, still a um, good idea, but the, maybe package doesn't have it because it doesn't have any theoretical foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see how the because <laughs> uh, professor and yeah. I met earlier today and my models looked a lot better for the GAM fitting? And then I don't know what happened. Um, I think the I would guess this is just by chance. So I mentioned that the graph for X1 and it looks very good, right? So no linear yeah. relationship, but actually the X1 is uh, uh, in reality a factor variable. So this kind of, you know, seemingly, you know, meaningful curve is just happened by chance. Maybe there are several categories that which is more useful, maybe around X1 value of 10 to 15. So I think that this is just a factor variable. So probably it doesn't really make sense. And others, uh, X5 may have some curvature. Others, I think almost linear and with very wide variability. And yeah, ID is factor, so probably that doesn't matter. So maybe the only useful features are X5, 6, 8, 19 and the x5 has slight curvature but not large so probably you know, it has only marginal impact on improving the model yeah that is my uh you know diagnosis but the, yeah it, it's a good try anyway okay so do you have any questions does anyone have questions to paula Yeah, so yeah, you can see that I think the 5820 um, presentation, the, um, it's pretty challenging, right? So um, the Rajesh did the uh, good comparison uh, of several models by cross validation. And the DSS are, you know, the basically based on some um, regression models, but they're not really, you know, the um, side by side comparison of multiple models. So it's very hard to do that. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, and the, the um, I will ask you to vote the uh, best three presentations at last, the best one, second best one and third best one. So just the make a memo memo so that the which presentations are good. So the overall best one among the, I mean, the all dates. So the um, overall best one, second one, and third one. And I will uh, ask you to vote after the all presentations. Okay, so uh, next time. Yeah, so anyway, so the, um, the all of you did a good presentation. And next time, I think the Sarah and Sai and the Marim and Brennan and Mira, uh, those five students will make a presentation. Okay. Uh, do we have to comment on our own? Um, no. no. Okay. I will put Good. something, yeah, some okay. default score of one or something. Yeah. You don't okay, really cool. have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> If you do, I don't penalize it. And you cannot, uh, you know, vote for you, you are yours as best presentation, okay, even if you think it's best, okay. <laughs> just for uh, fairness. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for today. And the next time we have five presentations, so probably we have to spend time until maybe around 7 p.m. So just, uh, uh, I hope everyone can attend the, uh, class until 7 p.m. And last day, six presentations. So probably we need up to 7.30 or something. OK, so do you have any questions? OK, so thank you for your presentation, Antarang, Priyanka, Paul, and um, Rajesh. And the, I, I hope to see more presentations on Thursday.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.